Welcome to Talks at Google. My name is Ileana Ovaya, and I'm on Google's Global Procurement Responsibility Team, focused on driving responsibility, inclusivity, sustainability for Google and our supplier partners. I serve as Vice Chair of Trustees of the Anthropological Museum of Us, and I come to you today from my hometown of San Diego, California, and the land of the Kumeyaay Nation. I'm so pleased to be your moderator today. Audience, as you as you think of questions throughout this conversation, please be sure to add them to the live chat on the right-hand side so we can answer them toward the end of our talk. Thank you. And now I'm very excited to introduce today's guest, Leela Downs. Leela Downs is a renowned international musician and one of the most influential artists in Latino America. She has one of the most unique voices in the world and is known for her colorful, and charismatic performances. While her early work has been described as pop or jazzy, her own compositions evolved into combining genres of diverse rhythms, such as folklorico, Mexican rancheras, corridos, cumbias, bolero, hip hop, blues, and soul, winning her multiple Grammys and Latin Grammy awards. The daughter of a Scottish American professor father and an indigenous mixed tech singer, businesswoman, mother, this Oaxacan born singer songwriter grew up splitting her early years in both Minnesota, USA, and Oaxaca, Mexico. Her tricultural identity frequently influences her lyrics, which focus on justice, immigration, and women's rights. So with an extensive entertainment resume, wow, Leela has recorded duets with artists as diverse as Mercedes Sosa, Caetano Veloso, Juanes, Nora Jones, Juan Gabriel, Car Carla Morrison, Santana, and among many others. And she's also performed with symphonies such as Chicago, San Francisco, and the UNAM Symphony in Mexico. And she's given concerts at Carnegie Hall, the White House, Lincoln Center, the Teatro Colón in Buenos Aires, the Holiday Bowl, the National Auditorium in Mexico City, and she even performed at the Oscars for her participation in the film Frida. And what's most exciting is most recently in 2020, Lila earned an honorary doctorate from the Berkeley School of Music in Valencia, Spain. Dr. Lila Downs, it is my pleasure to welcome you to Talks at Google. Thank you so much. Very nice listening to this amazing introduction. <laughs> Ileana. Oh, thank you, Lila. It is wonderful to be here with you today. We are uh, blessed with an hour. Uh, we'll have about 30 to 35 minutes of discussion together, and then we'll take questions from the audience towards the end. And really today, we hope that we really hope to inspire human connections by exploring the human experience, and specifically your career and your journey and the many facets that make beautiful you. Thank you. So we'll start. Um, I had had the pleasure here in San Diego to see you twice in concert. Um, and uh, right here, it's a, a tri-national region. I mean, one of the things that I really love is uh, your story of becoming, becoming and how you reconnected with your indigenous roots. Can you share with the audience um, you know, how you did that and about your experience growing up in the United States and later in Mexico. And then if you would help us, you know, understand how that experience shaped the art, um, your art, and then how that background influenced your music. Mm -hmm. I love the way you phrase the question because, you know, um, defining yourself is a process that we continue to journey throughout our lives. And I think that, um, yes, part of a big part of, of what it is, is, is um, a framework of, of being art and feeling like you are part of an artistic um, expression of life and also your, your existence is also a work of art. And I think that this has helped me in a spiritual manner um, but, but of course, when I was a child, I was a very confused child because I had three different identities that influenced 
my life and and the beauty of the music that I was learning. And um, and so I think slowly I started to realize that I am a marginal, uh, I have a marginal existence in in the world of things. And um, and then I realized that the women, especially, who are the people who give me my identity uh, as a woman, are considered to be marginal. Yeah. So I think uh, the rest of, of my life, after I kind of realize what's happening in an intuitive manner, I start composing songs that have to do with these women. And this is why I start composing songs about food and immigration and um, dark skin versus light skin and the issues that we need to deal with as Mexican Americans, as Latin Americans in the U.S. And of course, in Mexico, as um, a Mexican national and as a Mexican national with an indigenous identity. Um, so all these things have helped me um, ha have really given me peace from within and, uh, and also learning more about the philosophical importance of, um, of Mother Earth and, and having that as a center to um, the work that, that, I, that I continue to create uh, through my songs and through performances. Uh, we have been able to have, have connections with the Pan American Native and Indigenous uh, audience, as, as well as um, you know uh, the different countries that we visit, and I feel like we have so much in common. I mean, you really, really touched on that intersectionality of your of your being and your becoming, and it's um, it's a really it's a really hard process, I think, for people to come to a moment where they're able to realize, um, you know, loving themselves as, as they are. And um, how now that you have come to that, how do you how do you feel like you're staying authentic to yourself um, and continuing to flourish? Um, can you give us an example of because I think one of the things you kept talking about was marginalization. So can you maybe give us an example of um, like a time where you really had to stand up for this, for respect in this yeah. intersectionality and talk about that and how you handled it? Yeah, I think one of the good examples are textiles. I studied textiles in part because I wanted to know about the historical context of cloth and the symbols on cloth and how, um, uh, since I studied anthropology in part, I designed my own, um, my own thesis in uh, speaking about the importance of textiles and how what we wear really expresses um, who we are, and it also gives um, uh, a notion of our cosmos, of our um, of our vision in life, of our sensibility, and of course of of our beauty. Um, so I think that is where I focused. I focused on symbols and textiles, and and that's where I discovered that. Um, there are many expressions through the woman's world of our own vision of, of history um, and, and how each of, of those cycles in life are marked as well by ourselves in our own way and in our own manner. Mm -hmm. and, and that really kind of uh, uh, taught me to look at art in quite a different way, I believe. And um, I, I began to be more resourceful with, with this vision and, and instead of feeling it as, as an oppressive 
uh, event, which which did happen throughout my childhood and adolescence, and I would say even through my college years, I did feel like, um, you know, I was swimming against the current. Um, and I still do at times, but I really feel like somehow I have contributed uh, to a different vision about, um, about looking to our roots for meaning and for strength. Uh, you talk about your textiles. Uh, I'm a huge fan of uh, Oaxacan textiles and what you've and and all over our indigenous cultures, to be honest. And when you perform, um, you explode onto the stage in color um, and passion. And today is no different. You're wearing something beautiful. And since you talk so so lovingly about these textiles and what you studied, can you tell us about what you're wearing today? Yes, of course. This is a textile from uh, a northern and eastern region of Oaxaca. And it's a region that has a, a tropical area and is very warm. And one of the characteristic uh, meals from this region is uh, a beautiful soup that um, is done by the river. The people gather the shrimp and they put it in a gourd and then they, they actually make a fire with volcanic stones that are in the riverbed. And uh, these, these stones are really, really hot. So they put the shrimp, the clean shrimp, inside with the water from the river and then they add this this boiling stone into the gourd and it boils and in it and it also kind of it makes you go back in time and makes you think about how how we have developed as uh as human beings and how food um you know uh represents part of our lives and, and our stories, our particular stories. And this textile that I'm wearing is, um, this symbol is actually quite common on, on many of the, um, of the archeological sites in Oaxaca. And it's the different, the corners of the universe is one of the expressions about this symbol. So it's really, Trippy, my friends from the Grateful Dead would say. <laughs> it's very trippy because it's one of those things that that you think is so literal, but it really is huge. Yeah. And uh, and this is the way this ethnic group is. I have an auntie who comes from this particular group, and she, of course, speaks her native language, which is Chinanteco. And she always is giving me these different roots and herbs, and she she uh, she knows how to heal, and which is very common for the women there. And uh, and she's a, a, an amazingly strong lady, so it gives you a, a little idea of how this this is very meaningful to me. That is uh, beautiful. I wasn't expecting. So I should have expected that beautiful explanation, but you also have made me hungry. Now, um, <laughs> uh, what I love is you're talking about your auntie and you actually, and the voice that you're giving to our indigenous families through your music, through what you're doing here today, um, which is very important. And you've sung songs in Mixteco, Zapoteco, Maya, Purupecha, Nahuatl, and other languages. Um, you don't really see a lot of big hit performers doing that, uh, Lila. And it's um, how, what kind of advice would you give to others who want to surface themselves and really give more voices to our indigenous populations in this manner? I um, mean, how can they do that without uh, feeling or other people feeling like they're appropriating um, mm -hmm. our indigenousness or, or exploiting it? I think that if you're conscious of the meaning behind uh, the messages that you are singing, then I think it gives it uh, respect. It, it gives uh, a connection 
for other people to understand. And this is something that I have always as well tried to incorporate in our performances, always uh, translating the meaning of these songs. Um, of course, sometimes I, I don't because I don't feel that it's necessary to. I sometimes I think the power of art uh, should transcend with the power of, of the, the force of the piece or the force yeah. of the song. Um, but at times it is important as well to say, listen, this is the message. And, um, and it's important to see how the native messages are also can be funny or poke fun at yourself or uh, irreverent or, or very ritualistic. I mean, uh, many times we have notions about, you know, uh, stereotypes about people, which happens a lot in the U.S. Uh, and I think the, the challenge is to break those stereotypes and to show people how amazingly universal Native people can be as well. Uh, so we talk about clothing. Um, what What message, and I feel like you've touched on this a little bit, but what message do you want people to feel when they, when you wear your traditional clothing, when they're at your concerts or they see you? What do you want them to feel specifically? I want or them to feel curiosity and uh, to be in awe of the beauty. Um, and and sometimes, you know, I think art is so amazing that way that that the power of of the way that you may dress with something and if you have a regal manner about it, you can somehow change, totally change the notion that people have about, or the judgment about uh, ethnic um, clothes, you know, the way that people look at ethnic clothes. And I think that the notion of, of someone else wearing ethnic clothes is very close-minded because if you think about it, um, you know, it's it's a it's a limited vision on on the diversity that that is happening in the world, uh, just as it is with sexuality, or just as it is with um, the the things that we have been living as women as a gender in recent times. So I think that um, yeah, we need to open up about our vision of what is beautiful and what is not, and. Um, do the people who are legitimate only wear ties and suits? No, of course not. I think that we're starting to, to learn and open up about the, this vision. Uh, thank you for sharing that because I feel that same message is threaded throughout your music. And you incorporated a lot, a lot of folk music into your lyrics and, and how you develop uh, you're, you're, I think over a dozen albums now that you've had. Um, can you, can you share with us maybe a folk song that you, that really meant so much to you that you threaded it throughout your music and then tell us, you know, why you wanted to get that message out, why mm -hmm. you chose that song. And, and maybe you might share a little bit of what that sounds like with us. Yes. Um, let's see. Uh, Suri kuse chahi yu i suta chinis kakuta ni kakuri na kanyu u hanyu nyu u hiyoko nandu kuri nyu nyu kwachiri haka da inka ni kandi hari nakani shiniri kwachiri haku and venuni hanuri soy hija de un hombre de piedra venado con viento parió nací del color de la tierra de un baño de fuego y vapor Volví al refugio de razas de piedra del lodo, al seno de sangre manchada por todo, 
al campo de infancia y de muerte, al viento que impuso mi suerte, volví a la tierra que mis sentimientos amaban, donde yo no hallaba lo que yo buscaba, por este momento he vivido, hoy vivo mi orgullo perdido. So this is a song that is based on um, on the the vision that um, that I had when I read the pre-Hispanic books that survived the Inquisition, and they happened to be uh, saved and uh, written by my ethnic group, which is Mishtik. And there are many pictographs that, that show us these different characters that lived in, in our pre-Hispanic past. Some of them have beautiful names like eight deer and uh, nine herb and beautiful, uh, you know, really trippy names. We go, yeah. come, go back to that. <laughs> Grateful Dad. <laughs> uh, they have names like this because they are represented in the Mesoamerican calendar. We need to remember that we had our original calendar and those were the names of our days. And, uh, and so it's very poetic and very beautiful. And when, when I learn a little bit in Mixtec, in my mother's language, about these uh, characters, we would, we would analyze some of the words in Mixtec and we would come up with these beautiful poetic images uh, in Spanish, of course, because part of this song is in Spanish, but it's um, the, the translation of this piece is, is uh, the seed of a stone. And the reason the, the stone is so important in our past is because these are the, the expressions of, and the survival of our, of our pride and of our edifications and of our great cultures that have, um, you know, that you can come and see in Monte Alban and in Mitla and the region where I grew up, uh, there are also some important uh, places that you, that you can visit that um, date to, you know, 900 AD and um, all these amazing stories about the leaders and the spiritual aspects of them. So what I'm saying in the song is, is uh, combining these elements with the notion of migration and coming back to a place that you did not know how to appreciate. And you come back to the place where your belly button is buried the way that we traditionally do in, in our, uh, when we are born. Uh, it's traditional in the villages that the grandmother, the mother buries this little little uh, belly button under a tree or under um, the metate, the, the, the stone grinder, uh, so that the child will always return to their, to their hometown. I would like to acknowledge that I had to catch my breath after you sung. Um, <laughs> I, I would, and I know that I'm not the only one. I, I wanted to acknowledge and I wanted to thank you for sharing your voice and, and singing to us today and really uh, expounding on my question and in real, in real life and beauty. I also, um, you talk about returning home and that's, that really is something that happened to you. You did the same thing in, from this song. Um, and do you want to talk about where you were in that process even now? Like you're living in Oaxaca and you moved um, there. So can you make that connection for us? Yeah, well, I had the privilege of going back and forth because my father was teaching at the university. Um, and as I was, as I was growing up, I, I realized that there were uncles of mine and cousins 
that did not have those privileges of crossing the border. So I think that that started to, to become a source of preoccupation for me and also my mother's story. My mother was a very um, humble woman who, who traveled from her village to, to the village where I grew up called Tlajiaco. Mm -hmm. um, she, she walked barefoot, you know, when she was 14 years of age, they married her at that time and she ran away and, uh, and she only spoke Mishtek. And, and so when, you know, you hear these things in your family and you, and you see the pain and you also see the force. And, and so I think that for me, I, I started to realize that having this privilege of having uh, two, two and, and sometimes three languages when I am able to sing in my indigenous language, um, I needed to, to make and translate those stories to the different audiences because I, I think it's very important. Sometimes we we have notions about things and, and we, we judge people based on a certain idea that we have. But once we experience it for ourselves, then we realize that, yeah. you know, um, that, that things are quite different. And this, this is one of the things that I wanted to do through the music. That's why uh, singing mainly in Spanish has been very important, but also singing in, in English at, as well, to be able to, to tell stories and in, and in Mixteco and other languages that I have uh, been able to, to learn uh, through, you know, writers and poets that have been, um, you know, partners in, in this uh, artistic path. So many questions, Lila. So I'm going to ask you, I'll go back to one because you talked about going back and forth. When you travel now outside of Mexico, yes. how, is, how is the perception of Mexico by other countries changed over the years? And, and, and please feel free to share, uh, you know, good or bad, or what, what do you see from where you sit? I see that I think that we're we're really the moda right now. We're we're you know we're a trend. We're trending, and uh, and it it makes me very happy that people you know someone showed me a list about uh, the kinds of music that's in right now, uh, and and Mexican music is up there. It's like third on the you know and in, in popular music in the world, and that's. That's wonderful. It's beautiful to see that people are taking us seriously as legitimate individuals, because I think this is something that I have fought for in, in our songs. And uh, I, hope, I hope that people are open to our different sensibilities and artistic expression is so strong in our country. So it's wonderful to see that. Um, and, and of course, um, after uh, we had this very difficult president in the U.S. that constantly trashed Mexicans, I think uh, it's, it was a very painful time for us and for Latin Americans because I, I noticed, you know, when, when I do go to the U.S., I noticed that, that they really, you know, pushed us all together. And, uh, and then so Argentinians, even though sometimes they might be lighter skinned and then, you know, Chileans and, and per Peruvians and, you know, we're all in the same, in the same area because we all speak Spanish with each other. And uh, there's so much ignorance about who we are and our uh, diversity in each of our countries and how rich our identities can be. Um, I'll share an antidote there that um, depending on where I am in the U.S., people will think I'm different. They, 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 they just say you're, you're Hispanic or Latin. But if I'm in San Diego, I'm Mexican. If I'm in Florida, I'm Cuban or Puerto Rican. If I'm in New York, I'm Puerto Rican. Yeah. It just really depends on where the migration patterns have landed in, in the United States. And uh, I am Guatemalan, Puerto Rican, American. And so... Um, 
I understand what you're saying and that bulking us into, you know, one big group. Um, you also, that pain that you felt during uh, that time um, in the U.S., you translated that into another opportunity for your music as well. Um, do you want to talk about that? Well, I kind of feel like, um, you know, if if there is hate in the world and you go with hate and you're constantly talking about hate and you're, you know, I mean, sometimes, yeah, obviously you have to write songs about this and about racism and about these things. But I think that for me, you know, I think the earliest example in my life was writing about um, a very negative experience that I had with a young man when I was, when I was 16, right after my father died. And it's really strange how when you go down that lane, you know, you bring back all those emotions, all the oppression and all the, the negativity and, and the feeling helpless in a way. So I, I think that we're in another moment right now. And I think it's very important for Latin Americans to, to really take a stand and, and, and say, you know, we're not going to put up with, with this kind of, um, you know, primitive uh, notion of who we are as, as people. And, and I think it depends on, on, you know, the art and on, on legislation and on, um, Education, of course, which seems to not be very much of a priority every place you look. But, um, but I think that, you know, there are so many other things that we need to, to say and do. And so I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to answer your question. I don't want to go there again. It. That's good. <laughs> good. No, I really appreciate that sentiment. Um, and you also, you know, that we're talking about sort of the ingredients in your songs, how you pull from different experiences and those ingredients create your songs. Yeah. So what are the non-negotiable ingre ingredients uh, that a Leela Dow song must have? Well, I don't know about that. I don't, I think that's a, that's a kind of limited way to look at art because art can be like a dream and it can and it can be you know meandering in different ways and and sometimes it it says something even more profound than than what you thought you should have as a, as a as a rule you know in your songs so i i do it's true that i have written songs about justice and about uh, women who who work under the radar, women who are at the maquiladoras on the border. Um, I have written songs about uh, women who are in in um, kind of invisible, but at the same time have a lot of power. And and I have written songs about food and and about uh, drink, about mezcal. And of course, these are the songs that I think are, you know, they're the favorite ones, the happy ones, I, I believe. Um, but, but yeah, I think that it, I mean, I, I'm trying to go back to your question and think, yeah, are there certain rules? There are, I mean, there are in a repertoire as a performer. I think you know that you need to have something melancholic because that is uh, very Mexican in one way, and it also carries a lot of the indigenous um, uh, history in it. Um, and also, we, ne we need to be very festive. But, you know, I, when I think about certain tours that I have done, I've, I've gone sometimes more extreme in one way and sometimes more extreme in the other, all depending on and the moment we're living socially, I think that that's more important to me than to have any rules about songwriting. Yeah. You mentioned that people love the, hap the happy songs, the ones about yeah. food and drink. And I, I will admit my, my, one of my favorites is La, La Cumbia de Mole. 
<laughs> I love that song. It makes me happy every time you sing it. Oh, such, that's wonderful. Such enthusiasm. It's one of my favorites. And um, you're right. Absolutely. And I think of also it, when you do sing about music and food, just the music and food in, you know, what is now Mexico, right? From the food is and the music and the and the drink is just something so inspirational and i don't think sometimes people don't realize how different the food is from the board from different regions of mexico one thousand percent different and yeah. you can experience again just you know um you, you connect with with your fellow humans just by experiencing their different foods um, yeah. and and i think you bring us that platter in your music as well um you really do bring of great diversity in your music. Um, you. And so I will ask you, um, where is your favorite location to perform? Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, I just came back from the mountain. We went six hours away driving up, up in La Sierra, up in Puebla. Mm -hmm. And I think my favorite places are these kinds of places that are really hard to get to, um, where a lot of people think, what on earth, why would you want to go up there? Well, part of the reason is indigenous food is all, um, it's, it's all organic, of course, this word that we use in such a free manner in the cities. But what does organic mean? It means that um, you are not using any fertilizers and and you're just using the land and maybe maybe a natural fertilizer, a little uh, a little sheep poop and <laughs> you know these natural things that happen in the, in the campo in the in the little villages in the rural villages and they gave me a basket of um, of fresh. Uh, very special, big, really big beans, and they gave me a block from the from from the um, pumpkin blossoms. They gave me the greens, which we eat in soup, mm -hmm. and then they gave me a bunch of chiles because I I just wrote a song about chiles, so they love that. And it's about um, the tequio and the guesa, which is what we call in Zapotec, guesa means giving and receiving. And so to them, when I got there, they gave me a uh, baston de mando, which is, um, it's, um, it's kind of, uh, it's the, it's the ruler's, um, oh, what do you call a baston? Este, un baston que es un, este, um, Ay, ay, ay. Um, what do you call this thing that people hold on to that el a the cane. elders to a get cane. up? Mm. Yes. It's the cane, but for elders. And it's only given to those who will lead. And so when, uh, you know, we have a system of native uh, political system in Mexico, in the villages. So you have a council of elders and they're the ones who decide who will be the president, the municipal, the municipal president. And so they received me with this beautiful ritual and with the incense burner, with the copal, and they cleansed me. And uh, I really needed this cleansing because mm -hmm. we've been having some strange things happening to us lately. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so you know you can you can imagine, and it's this mysterious place that you arrive to, and it's in the middle of the mountains and. And it's all these clouds, you know, it's like you going into the clouds. It's just so beautiful and surrounded by different indigenous communities who come and do the, their market in this more mestizo village. Yeah. But you just see the appreciation for um, the, and the importance for them to teach, to keep teaching our people about the importance of our roots. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that's why they wanted me to come there. And, uh, and probably a lot of artists, you know, w don't wanna go to these places, like I said mm -hmm. before. 
but those are my favorite places. Sorry. I love that. I love that. <laughs> That was such a beautiful picture you painted. And uh, thank you for that. I, again, um, a beautiful description. What are you listening to now? Oh, wow. I'm listening to some uh, modern regional Mexican songs. This singer called Karin Leon. And I'm listening also to Natanael Cano. Mm-hmm. And I also listen to John Coltrane and... Uh, um, I love to to always go back to Mercedes Sosa. I see. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm going to ask you um, a few quick questions because guess what? We have some wonderful audience questions we want to get to. But Great. just a, a quick uh, rapid fire, a few questions for you. Um, what new artist has caught your attention? Natanael Cano. Uh, many people admire you for your creativity, powerful music, and voice. What is one seemingly unremarkable thing about yourself that makes you relatable? Oh, my. Um, I am not very nice until I have my coffee in the morning. <laughs> tu cafecito. Okay, that makes sense. Excellent. Uh, horchata or rosa de Jamaica or, uh, or other? <laughs> I'm a horchata person. <laughs> Excellent. I had to get those in. Um, I, I would love to. We have a few questions from the audience. Uh, thank you for answering those questions. What, what a delight. Let's go to those. Just one second. Okay. From Farah. Uh, thank you so much for coming today, Leila. Based on your life experiences, what advice would you give your younger self? Um, I think I would say that it's, um, it's going to be okay. (laughs) I was a very angry younger person, but you know, I also look back at that and I, and I see that anger feeding the art. So I, I, I don't repent of anything. And I really, I really would just say, yeah, um, take it in stride. It's going to be cool. (laughs) <laughs> that's beautiful that's good advice um from chris um lila what advice would you give latinx folks trying to work in the entertainment industry globally and here in the states can you repeat the beginning of the question sure. from chris uh lila what advice would you give latinx folks trying to work in the entertainment industry globally and here in the States? I think um, just, uh, you know, be persevere and, and in spite of all the adversity, keep going, you know, because um, cause there's a huge audience out there waiting to, to connect. How many years do you think it took you to finally feel that you connected? I think uh, probably after my 15th year of, of performing and, you know, being on the road, I, th- I started to feel like, you know, like uh, people were recognizing what, what my message was. And, um, and you know what I love is I love to find people who have no idea who I am and uh, and then, you know, win them over because they just, you know, their mouth drops and they go, really, this exists. You know, it's just suddenly people realize that indigenous life is alive. And that's something that I love to see. I love that you said that, too, that because I think the perception is that it, was, awesome. at, it was at one time. That is no longer here. Exactly. Including in ourselves, in our own nationalities, we have this problem. Mm-hmm. Agree. Thank you, Farah and Chris. We have another question. Ugo. Uh, Lila, you've collaborated with so many different artists. Is there someone you've always wanted to collaborate with that you haven't yet? Or someone you'd like to collaborate with now? Yes, I would always, I'd, I'd always love to do something with Alejandro Fernandez. That would be a great gift for me. 
Oh, that yeah. would be so fun. And for us. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> we have, I believe, one more question from Wendy. Thank you for singing for us. Mi mamá es de Oaxaca. Given your extensive advocacy work with immigration and indigenous populations, what legacy do you hope to have that others can carry forward? Um, I think that we need to continue to educate people through art, I think is the best way. Um, and, but also I think, you know, things need to change in, in the legal sense as well. But I do think art somehow crosses the bridges that sometimes can, uh, can lead to more negative uh, reactions towards, towards, you know, uh, um, legitimation. So I, I do believe in, in, in the power of art. I think we can move mountains. Can we talk a little bit more about that? Um, I think that globally there's some wonderful institutions or even communities where you can, one can see, you know, this type of art that you're talking about. What have been some of your favorites that you might recommend to us? And just tell us where to go out, off the beaten path or popular ones, just ones that we might be able to draw from to learn, to not only experience what you just said, but to learn from. Um, you mean indigenous or organizations? Yeah. I wasn't clear as to yeah, what. Yeah, I would say as we, as you talk about art, because I think the question really was, you know, what kind of legacy do we want to leave forward? And um and I, I, yeah, I think indigenous or any, I, as an anthropologist, because you really studied anthropology. And so I would start with indigenous, but also any other um, worthy art locations or, or communities that you think are, you know, a place where people can discover and find that human uh, connection. Well, I think that, you know, there are institutions, institutions sometimes um, can be not pro so progressive and sometimes they can be very progressive. Um, it all depends on how long they've been around, uh, including here in Oaxaca. A good example is an, an institution of the, the Museum of Modern Art of Oaxaca was created and donated by a great artist, a visual artist who is Zapotec. Uh, his name is Francisco Toledo. Mm -hmm. But what happened with that uh, institution is that, you know, it was taken over by um, different NGOs and and now it's kind of impossible um, to, to go there and not feel like you're being politicized in some way. And, mm -hmm. you know, once in a while there's an exhibit that's great, but, but it's just this, uh, you know, things change. So I think, I think what, what one needs to do is to to figure it out kind of on, on your own, figure out how things are changing. And I know that I struggle with this. This is a, it's a good question in the sense that things are constantly changing. And um, I, um, I remember that finding visual artists in the area of, of video was very easy at one point. And now everybody is using the, um, all these, uh, platforms that have to do with computerized images. And it's something that I cannot relate to. So it's kind of a moment in time where it's kind of hard to, to connect to people who are really doing, you know, live image and going out and taking images of, of people, of things, of animals, of nature. So I think it, it really depends on the area of interest that you may have. If you love textiles, well, uh, hunt for what has been done, right, in textiles. And, and it's so easy to look anything up now that uh, we have the internet in order to connect with many things that we would love to see. Um, of course, I would, I would steer you to, and, and the audience to look for, um, for artistic expression and music in, in uh, Southern Oaxaca. In Oaxaca, we have 
you know, a lot of things are happening here. Mm -hmm. And it can be a good example of, of a place that, it, that also is becoming more cosmopolitan and more international. Um, I think that often um, we often see, because you talked a little bit about, um, I think just really trying to figure out how to appreciate our indigenous cultures and even uh, Mexican art and Mexican personalities. And for example, a lot of them find more success outside of Mexico. Yes. And in your experience, how has your music been received around the globe? And then also, do you find a different kind of audience in different regions? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, I think I needed to, to leave Me Mexico in order to be taken seriously. I think um, also I still find that the case when I'm in my town in Oaxaca, you know, some people kind of, are like oh but you don't live here right it's it's kind of hard for them to to um i don't know i think it's like a displacement issue you know that people need to to feel like you are coming from the outside in order to respect what you have to say or if you have an authority over something and I think that is probably because it's a small place. It's a provincial place. So um, everybody knows each other. And it's kind of like, a, you know, a family, a small, a small family. So I, I think that definitely leaving your place of origin is important. Um, I also come from an ethnic group that by nature has a need to migrate and and I think we all have that in, in us, in our nature. Um, and we're living a time where there are so many people that are migrating for different reasons that can be because of the economics, but also it's about learning and about mm -hmm. finding other places to identify with and, uh, and with themselves, of course. Mm -hmm. You have historically done a lot of work with women um, and education. Can you tell us what are you involved in at the moment? What is it that you, what is your passion work at the moment? Because we know you're, in addition to an artist, you do a lot of things. So tell us a little bit about what you're up to these days. I have been writing a little bit more. I've, I'm kind of writing. It started as a bio, as a biography, but it, it's kind of turning into several stories that I used to listen to from childhood and also throughout my life. Um, some of them are kind of scary, I would say. Yeah, kind of scary. I think that being afraid is, is kind of a feeling that I remember from my childhood. And, and I, I do think it has something to do with, um, with, with feeling, um, you know, like um, shunned or feeling, uh, you know, but also being being Mexican. There's something there's something about cruelty that is interesting for me to explore in in our culture, and and so I'm writing about it, and uh, and writing about being a singer. I think singer being a singer is also a challenge in Mexico because I think everybody sings, you know? So it's kind of like, oh yeah, big deal, right? <laughs> You're a singer? Oh yeah, big deal. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting to explore that, you know, and understand where is that coming from, you know? I think it's, I think it's like, um, it's an issue with our history, with our, um, with the male uh, dominated society and and also with the notion of art, uh, since we are very artistic in every corner of Mexico, um, art has another. It's like very practical as well. So that's fascinating yeah. to me. Yeah. Like you said, the moda now. <laughs> moda, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> well, I, I think this group should know. You heard it here first that that Leela is writing a potential biography and really writing writing your thoughts about being a musician and also um, of your experience. Yeah. Yeah, in part, and my my uh, you know my vision, my time, and and also as a woman, you know, being a woman has been. It, it has been a beautiful experience to see how things have been changing through different uh, generations. And now I have a, I'm a mama. So I have a, a child who is five, a little girl who is five and a, and a young boy who is 12. Uh -huh. And so learning through them once again is this amazing thing. And, um, you know that that my daughter is Zapotec and my son is Chatino, so also looking up their ethnicities and and their history as well is is amazing. I didn't uh, realize you had a daughter as well. So Benito and your and a daughter now. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we are um, coming close to the end together, Lila. Um, I absolutely believe that with the things that you shared with us today, we absolutely have inspired people's human connections by exploring a human experience, which is, you know, you've talked about. And um, I want to just share with the audience to visit liladowns.com. I spent some time on there this week and last week and just to view her wonderful photo gallery hear her latest Al Chile album or any of the albums, you can visit her store. And best of all, you can catch her dates for her tour that it's called Volver, which I always want to start singing when I say that word. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. Although my voice is not as great as yours. Uh, so I would never attempt that. Hola, um, hola, the little one is back from school. Excellent. Yes. Hola. Hey, oh, hola. This is wonderful. Hola. This is great. What a treat. <laughs> oh, two for one. Um, Lila, thank you so much for joining us at uh, Talks at Google. It's been an incredible pleasure to be here representing so many people that admire you at Google and beyond. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful talk this afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, Leela. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Take care.